So what we're going to do now for the next maybe 25 or 30 minutes is talk about medical devices and cardiac arrest. You've seen one of the, the devices that's out on the market uh, this morning, so we'll look at a few other ones as well. Uh, I was wondering where to start this presentation, so I decided to go right back to the start and see where did resuscitation come from. And any of you who work in ICU will probably be familiar with the top left-hand picture. That was the first ever uh, oscillator. <laughs> so the quicker you ran, the higher the rate of the oscillation. So all these methods, the Holger Nielsen, Schaefer, etc., they were all designed at getting air in and out of the chest. So it worked to some extent for patients who had drowned, but it didn't do anything for circulation. Uh, and it didn't really do much for ventilation either. <laughs> so this guy in the 1950s called Peter Saffer, who is, I suppose, the, the father of modern, modern resuscitation, and he got some, again, only in America could you do this, he got some volunteers who volunteered to be anaesthetised and paralysed while he did mouth-to-mouth -mouth on them to prove that mouth-to-mouth -mouth expired air ventilation was enough to keep the patient alive. And surprise, surprise, they all survived. So that was the birth, really, of mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And at the same time, a colleague of his called Elam was doing some work on uh, chest compressions, initially on dogs and later on humans, and found that if you press the chest, then you got some circulation. And this is what we now know as CPR. So the, Elam and uh, Saffer were the guys that put the two elements together to come up with what we uh, know as, as modern, essentially, CPR. So what I'm going to do is look at some of the devices that can be used to enhance CPR from a circulation point of view. We know that when we press the chest, the chest wall goes down and it comes back up all by itself. But what if we can get the chest wall to come back up a little bit faster, a little bit more? And that was the theory behind active decompression. And this was actually developed in, again in Hennepin County, which seems to be one of the, the leaders in worldwide resuscitation research, by a guy called Keith Lurie. And he was an emergency physician who had a patient come into his department with his dad, and his dad had suffered a pre-hospital cardiac arrest, and the son did chest compressions using a toilet plunger. Now, I'm not entirely sure <laughs> that's exactly what it is, and th that's where it came from. So this guy decided to press in his dad's chest with a toilet plunger. I don't know how you make that leap, but he did. And, uh, and the, the guy survived and had a, a good neurological outcome. So the, the team in Hennepin County decided that they would try and develop this a little bit further. And they got Lairdal to initially manufacture and, and later market the device for them. And it was quite popular back in sort of the, the 90s and so on. And then it, it sort of went out of fashion. There wasn't a huge amount of evidence to say that it was any better than normal, uh, than normal CPR. What we do know about normal CPR is that if you do it in the back of a moving ambulance, it's dangerous. So here's Donna, she weighs about 20 kilograms, and this ambulance is uh, currently parked, but it would be, as you know, driving at you know, 180 kilometers an hour. And as you go around the corner, you lean to the side, you can fall off, you can hurt yourself, you can bang your head on stuff, and the quality of your CPR is probably diminished during the, uh, during the transport as well. Or is it? Well, yes, it is. None of us here are gonna be surprised by the fact that CPR in a moving ambulance, be it a road ambulance or a helicopter ambulance is, uh, is not as good as CPR on the floor. And there's lots and lots of research out there that proves that point. We all know it, but it's also proven. So is there a better way of doing it? And we saw this morning that there probably is a better way of doing it. So we've seen one of the uh, mechanical chest compression devices. And there are a few trials out there, uh, usually with, no, with low number. It's not a huge power in the trial to, to prove a really good, good outcome. But if you look in the, uh, the top one there, the meta-analysis, there is a subgroup of patients who are treated with a low distributing band device that had a 1.6 times um, better outcome than the patients who didn't get mechanical chest compression device. So the, all of the devices combined didn't really have an outcome, good or bad, on, uh, on patients, but this one low distributing band device did have a good outcome. Now, a lot of those trials are of sort of varying quality and varying numbers, so we think it's a lot better, but we haven't definitively proven it just yet. And there are three devices out there. I've actually used all three of them uh, at, at various times in various places, and they all have their, their charms and their little quirks. So the, the oldest one, or the one that's on the market longest, is the, uh, is the thumper. And that's essentially just a piston, so it's a gas-powered device that's got the blue board which sits under your, your patient's back, and uh, the piston comes down the patient's chest, presses, then releases, presses, then releases, and so on. The other feature of this particular one is that it's got a very basic ventilator um, attached to it as well, so the little box here on the left-hand side. So you can attach that onto your uh, ET tube or your LMA, and you can blow air in and let air out. So it's, it's a pretty basic device, uh, but it does work. So if you look at how it actually works in, in an ambulance setting, it's a pretty big thing to carry around, isn't it? Uh, so it, it's quite awkward. It's also quite awkward to store in the vehicle because of, of the size, and it's two bits. So if you're trying to, trying to go into a house with your pack 
and with your defibrillator and with your oxygen and with your thumper. That's a lot of stuff to carry. And the other problem that we found with it, as you can see here, is that it sticks out uh, from the patient's side. So when you're wheeling the patient around, this part can get stuck in a door and suddenly your patient's kind of gone off the, the side of the trolley. Um, so we do use it. It's quite successful in terms of providing chest compressions. How good it is in terms of providing outcomes, I don't know. The other one is what's called a load distributing band type of device, and that's the Autopulse, which is marketed by Zoll. And in this device, the whole chest gets compressed. So instead of the familiar thing where we put pressure just on the sternum, the whole chest gets compressed. And, uh, and, and that's sort of going back to the theory of you know, the, the, uh, the thoracic pump as opposed to the cardiac pump, if you like. So you're compressing the whole chest to try and force blood out of the chest as opposed to directly out of the heart. And again, the elastic recoil in the chest will, in theory at least, suck blood back in. Uh, how does it work in practice? It's another big backpack, and it's probably the heaviest of, of the devices. Uh, when it's on, it's quite neat. And uh, in fact, I've, I've had patients in, patients' families in, rather, who don't even know there's a device on. Because you can pull the blanket up over it, and it compresses away, and the patient's family doesn't even notice that there's a device. Um, I've not had a patient's family complain or even mention a, a <coughs> pumper-type device at all. They, they don't seem to notice or, or worry about it for, uh, for some reason. Here we go. Look, no hands. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that was a different night. Okay. <laughs> so, Lucas, too, you're familiar with this. You, you've seen this this morning. Uh, you've seen how it packs away. You've seen how it works in the ambulance. Uh, I think somebody asked me a question earlier about how it works in terms of, of narrow trolleys and, and loading and so on. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to cause a problem, certainly in the, in the Irish system. It just it slides in and out uh, with, with no major dramas. Um, earlier as well, I mentioned a colleague of mine, Darren Figgis, who works on the aircraft in Ireland, and he's done a master's project which has been presented as a poster and an oral presentation in the US, and he's in the, in the process of uh, submitting it for publication at the moment. But he got about 50 paramedics to compare the three devices and, and compare their attitudes towards them. Uh, so what he found is that the autopulse, like we said, is the heaviest. Uh, Lucas 2 is, uh, is quite light. Some of them are easy to carry, some of them are difficult to carry, and the, the biggest problem with the thumper was the overhang. Um, but overall, the, the paramedics that he surveyed found that the Lucas 2 was the easiest device to use. Does that make sense? So next thing, airway. Um, airway is important. Um, we found that intubation might not be that important, but certainly airway management is. So using something like an eye gel, do you guys use those on the road vehicles or LMAs? No. Okay, so an eye gel is, is essentially an LMA, but you don't have an inflatable cuff. So just down here at this end, it's, um, it's a gel-filled thing that takes the form of the larynx and, uh, and finds a good seal. And we find it like, quite a, a good device. It's very, very simple to insert and quite successful to, uh, to ventilate the patient with. One of the other devices that we've used, uh, again in Ireland and, and in other places, is the laryngeal tube, or the King LT. And this is, is quite cool. So it's, it's, got two, it's a single tube with, uh, with two balloons on it. So essentially you, you put this down blind, so just shove it in the mouth and about 99% of the time the distal balloon will go into the esophagus. And then you just blow up this, uh, this uh, pilot balloon here and the two cuffs inflate. So this one will inflate in the esophagus and this one is a bit bigger and will inflate in the, uh, in the oropharynx. And guess what? There's a hole in the middle. So the only place, when you ventilate through here, the only place the air can go or the gas can go is out through here and it should go into the trachea. So again, it's not as definitive as, uh, as an intubation, but it's very quick, very simple, and, um, and doesn't cause too much trouble. Anyone heard of a Boussignac ET tube? This is like a toy shop, isn't it? So a Boussignac ET tube is essentially a normal ET tube, except that in the wall, there are seven channels. So this oxygen tubing is attached onto the, uh, to the seven channels, and oxygen will be kind of forced down th along the, uh, through the walls of the tube and just... Um, extruded here at the, at the distal end, which is essentially in your lungs, isn't it? So you don't necessarily have to ventilate the patient to get carbon dioxide out, but you can get passive oxygenation of the patient. And some of the places in the US that were doing, as we heard earlier, the cardiocerebral resuscitation protocol where they were not ventilating, were using Boussignac tubes to oxygenate even though they weren't squeezing a bag or using a ventilator to get the, uh, to get the, the gas in and out. Was popular for a while not quite so popular, not a huge amount of research to show that it actually works. Were all those other pilot tubes coming on? They were for, um, sort of for research to find the pressures. This is just a, a picture from the internet. I don't have an actual pressure of a tube. But they were measuring pressures in the trachea distal to the balloon to see what the airway pressures were. Um, okay, so how do you get the tubes in? 
Well, we know we're all familiar with using laryngoscopes, so direct vision, you have a look at the cords, you pop the tube through, it's all nice and simple, isn't it? Except sometimes it's not. Uh, so there are now indirect laryngoscopy devices. So the air track is the one on the right. And the air track essentially has a prism, so there's a, uh, almost a camera down here, and you can peer in through here and see around the corner. So you don't necessarily have to see in a straight line down to the cords, but you can see the cords and then you can guide your, uh, guide your tube through. And there are fancier versions of that as well. The King, uh, King Vision is one of the ones that we carry on the aircraft and on the road vehicles here. So it's got a video screen and again you can see around the corner uh, for difficult intubations. And if you've got plenty of time to practice with it, it's quite a useful device, but it's just that it's not so useful to be taken out of your bag twice a year or three times a year when you're in trouble at a cardiac arrest. The key thing is that you need to get blood circulating and get air in and out uh, with some sort of airway, not necessarily an ET tube. Happy enough? Okay, next thing. Defibrillation is shockingly simple, isn't it? How long do you think, in, or I beg your pardon, defibrillation is shockingly simple. How long do you think we've been defibrillating people for? 100 years? Egyptian times. Egyptian times. <laughs> That was the wheel. Um, it, was actually, it was actually developed uh, in Belfast in Northern Ireland in the 1950s, 60s rather, uh, by a guy called Frank Pantridge. So the defibrillator was there, but it weighed about 70 kilos. So pre-hospital defibrillation is, is actually an Irish invention, so we'll take credit for that. Uh, and what he did was he loaded his 70 kilogram defibrillator into a van and was able to drive the van to different wards. So he was able to get the defibrillator to the patient in the ward. And subsequently that was developed with a smaller uh, defibrillator that he was able to put into, um, that, believe it or not, is an ambulance, not a bread van. And he was able to drive it out into the streets of Belfast. And the first pre-hospital defibrillation was, as far as I'm aware, in Belfast. CPR feedback. You've seen a little bit about this uh, this morning. You've seen this device here, which give, has an accelerometer which tells you how deep you're pushing, whether you've got full recoil in the chest, and will also give you... Um, a chest compression rate. And all the different defibrillator companies have similar devices. Uh, you can see the Laird Aller Philips one in the, in the background, and this is the Physio Control one in the, uh, in the foreground. It's all about quality CPR, like we heard this morning. So we know that our quality CPR deteriorates as time goes on, as we get tired, as we get bored, probably. Um, so some sort of device to prove that we're doing it right is, uh, is a really good thing. Do your Lifepack 15s on the road ambulances have metronomes? Yeah, they do. So a metronome is just a, a gong every, every uh, less than a second that, pr that shows you how to do it at the correct rate. Because again, we know that as you get tired, your rate slows down. Uh, so we want to get that 100 compressions a minute um, in, into your patient. This is out of sequence, which is uh, ironic given the title of the slide, but has anyone heard of this? So double sequential defibrillation, again, only in America. So what you can see there on the top of the picture is that this guy with two Lifepack 15s, and he's got a patient with refractory VF, so he's turned up the energy, the patient is still in refractory VF. What can we do next? What's better than one defibrillator? Two defibrillators. <laughs> so there's two defibs, two sets of pads, and one guy trying to push the button at the same time. Watch this space. So uh, the impedance threshold device is uh, used in terms of, of the breathing circuit, I guess, and what that is is a two-way valve, but it's got different resistances. So if you put your impedance threshold device, or the rescue pod, as it's, as it's marketed by, on the end of your ET tube, and somebody does chest compressions, what happens is every time you do a chest compression, you force a bit of gas out. And the one-way valve here, or the two-way valve with different resistances, doesn't allow gas to come back in. So each time we do a chest compression, you force gas out, elastic recoil in the chest reduces intrathoracic pressure, which in theory at least sucks blood back into the chest. Okay, and the more blood you have in the chest, the more blood you can then force out with your, uh, with your next chest compression. Sounds like it should work, except there's no evidence that it actually does, until you uh, combine it with something like a Lucas. Because remember we said earlier that the Lucas has both compression and active decompression. So the thumper will only compress and allow elastic recoil to, to bring the chest back up, but the, uh, the Lucas will press down and the suction cup or the uh, toilet plunger will bring the chest back up. So if you bring the chest back up in conjunction with a rescue pod or an impedance threshold device, you dramatically reduce intrathoracic pressure, which again, in theory, draws more blood into the chest and allows your chest compressions to be, um, to be more effective. When you combine the two, uh, they found that uh, CP so active compression decompression plus the impedance threshold device had a 7.9% survival compared to a 5.7% survival without it. So 
the impedance threshold device by itself, not a huge amount of benefit, but combined with an active decompression device does seem to work. Are you guys doing intraosseous access? But you don't have the easy IO, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. it's great fun. Um, so lots of different devices for getting intraosseous access. The one on the right is the bone injection gun developed by the Israelis. Um, so it's a bit violent. Has anyone ever used it? <laughs> Have you ever stuck it in your own hand? I've met someone who has. So is it working? Bang. Uh, yes, it's working. Um, so we did have a problem as well with uh, a couple of people who managed to bend the needle going into the tibia. Does that happen to you guys? Yeah. Uh, so they're not used a huge amount anymore. The one in the centre is the fast, and that goes into the sternum. So the military use that quite a lot because you might not have a lot of limbs left to, uh, to get intraosseous access. They use it in the sternum. In what we're talking about today in terms of pre-hospital and medical cardiac arrest, that's probably not a good device because it can detract from your hand placement and detract from actually doing chest compressions. So either the, the bone injection gun or the easy IO are probably better options. Uh, they're quite easy to put in. They're quick to put in. Whether we should use them over and above intravenous, not really proven, but I guess that if it's going to be quicker and definitively you will get it in, then it may well be better to use it as a first line. Uh, next thing we're going to talk about is carbon dioxide measurement. So I think I mentioned earlier that your colorimetric device is great. It'll tell you that you got the tube in the trachea at least once. It doesn't tell you that the tube is still in the trachea or remains in the trachea throughout your resuscitation and particularly throughout your moving from the scene phase. Uh, so having continuous capnography with a waveform on the screen is really good. The other thing it's good for is, uh, is deciding when you get ROSC. So if the patient gets spontaneous output of circulation, then the carbon dioxide is going to go up. Because remember, it's a function of how much carbon dioxide is coming back to the lungs and also how much carbon dioxide is coming out of the lungs. Okay, so and Cliff mentioned earlier that if you've got really good quality chest compressions with your Lucas, then you've got, you got a lot more carbon dioxide coming back, so the number is going to go up. And if you overventilate, it's going to go down. So it's a balance. But if you're doing continuous quality chest compressions and you suddenly see a spike in your entitled carbon dioxide, then check and see if you've got ROSC, because that's one of the things that can, uh, that can push it up. And that's about it. Anyone want to invent a device? The world's your oyster. <laughs> Has anybody got anything to add? Any other things that you've seen that I've missed out? Entitled for, um, for deciding when to stop resuscitation. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so there was a theory in the, in the recent past that if your entitled went <coughs> below 10, then the chances are that the patient's outcome was, was likely to be poor. However, having listened to Cliff this morning saying that with the, uh, with the Lucas, you get higher end titles and that you know, might cloud your judgment a little bit. I think if you're deciding to stop resuscitation, it's based on many factors, not just a number on your monitor. So it's, it's based on your patient, first of all, so the comorbidities, maybe the patient's age, uh, what the cause of the arrest was, how long the patient has been down before you got there, how long the patient's been down with you in situ, whether there's a reversible cause that you can potentially reverse and, and then add in things like your entitled CO2 and echo at the end just to, to make your decision absolute. Great, thanks very much. <laughs>